Part 1, Module 1 Fishing is better during the three days of the waxing of the new moon. Hunters do better going after quarry during the three days of the waxing of the new moon. Wounds heal faster during the waxing of the new moon as blood flow is stimulated. A cut will bleed more during the waxing of the new moon. The ocean is lifted and produces the highest tides during the waxing period of the new moon. And good people are better during the waxing of the new moon. And the reverse is true. Bad people get worse during the waxing period of the new moon. In other words, the waxing period of the new moon has an effect on virtually all things on the planet Earth. Sound like something from out of a science fiction book? Well, it's not. It's actually scientific fact. There are two basic periods of the moon, waxing and waning. The way we look at it, the way that I'm going to be describing it is that when the moon is waxing, it's coming into. When it's waning, it's going out of. It takes a bit less than 28 days for the moon to orbit the earth. And so there's a change from waxing to waning every 14 days. At the height of the full moon, the moon begins to go into the last quarter phase. The full moon is waning, going out of. Now it's seven days, and the waning of the full moon is complete, and the coming into or the waxing of the new moon begins. Now, three days prior to the height of the new moon, the waxing phase produces a stronger and stronger pull. This is the period and the facts that you want to know about. There are many other scientific facts regarding the moon that have an effect not only on your daily life, but also on your consciousness. So let me explain the phases of the moon as we know it through the science of astronomy. We're basically interested in four moon phases, the full moon, the new moon, and the two quarter moons. There are more. Other phases are known as crescent moons, as every hour that passes puts the moon in another position with regards to the Earth. This is due to the moon constantly moving around the Earth. When the moon is aligned on the same side of the Earth as the sun, in other words, the moon is between the Earth and the sun, the sun is shining on the side of the moon away from you, and you can't see that side. The side towards you is dark and can't be seen. That is called the dark of the moon, the old moon, or more commonly, the new moon. When the moon is alongside the earth, either on the left side or the right side, the sun shines on the side facing it, and we see only half of the moon. This is known as the half moon or the quarter moon. When the moon is on the opposite side of the earth with respect to the sun, the sun shines on the face of the moon that we see. This is, of course, the full moon. To simplify, moon, earth, sun, full moon. Earth, moon, sun, new moon. Moon on either side of earth, quarter moon. But instead of racking your brain about that, just download the lunar chart from the uh, New Moon program. Uh, it's in the members area, and that way you'll get a graphic representation of these lunar phases. The reason we're interested in the phases of the moon is for the same reason that fishermen, farmers, boat owners, and so on are interested. And that is because the moon has an effect on things on Earth. We all know that the moon has an attraction or pull on the earth. That's what causes the tides. There are higher tides during the new moon than there are during the quarter moon phases, as example. This is due to the gravitational pull of the moon attracting the waters of the ocean. This pull affects all things. During the new moon, the pull is strongest because you have the pull of the sun. Now, that's constant. Plus the pull of the moon when it's between the sun and the earth. 
Consider this. A farmer plows his field. He, then he plants a seed and waters it. The, the moisture softens the coat of the seed, the outer layer. Now, if he does this during the waxing of the new moon, when the moon is getting stronger and stronger, he will get a better yield than doing it during a quarter or even a full moon. Now, why would that be? Well, allow me to use a metaphor. You're walking up a hill. It's getting steeper and more difficult. Suddenly, you feel a hand at your back pushing you gently. The hand is at the small of your back pushing you forward and the walk gets easier. Well, it's the same thing with respect to that seed the farmers put into the ground. It's easier for the root tip to break through the coat of the seed if there's a force pulling from outside the seed. The root and tip, when breaking through, will automatically head in the right direction. The root towards the gravitational pull and the tip in the opposite direction of the gravitational pull of the earth. That's nature. With the additional pull of the new moon, when the pull is strongest, the root grabs hold, the tip heads upward more quickly, and like a newborn who's nourished well, grows into a bigger, a healthier plant. An old veterinarian friend told me something I wasn't aware of. He said, as I explained the new moon concept to a class some time ago, that he would never dehorn an animal during the new moon because in his experience, the wound would bleed too much. Apparently, the pull of the moon would cause the blood to flow too freely. The facts that arise that come about from this knowledge is that the moon, especially during the phase when it's between the earth and the sun, has a strong attraction for all things on earth. Knowing that, you can use this knowledge to your advantage. Now, let's get into a bit more scientific fact. Not only the moon, but all things that occupy space attract all other things. That attraction is known as gravity. To put it in its simplest form, it is that mass attracts mass. The greater the mass, the greater the attraction. The earth has a great mass. And that mass attracts a lesser mass, a satellite that we call the moon. In turn, the sun has an even greater mass, and that mass attracts all the planets in our solar system. But a person has mass also. So does a lima bean or a grain of rice. Infinitely smaller, but then the attraction is smaller as well. All physical things have a mass. Mass is any body of matter, or to put it in a way that's more understandable, anything that occupies space. A lima bean occupies space. A grain of rice occupies space, as does the sun, as do you. A seed occupies space, and so it has mass. Small, yes, but it is there. Now, that's scientific fact. Gravity affects all things in the universe, and it always has, from the instant of the so-called Big Bang to the present. The closer you are to the greater mass, the stronger the pull of gravity. When you're standing on the Earth, the pull of the sun and the moon is constant and not noticeable. However, when an astronaut, many miles away from the massive pull of the Earth, well, then gravity is seemingly gone and the astronaut floats. He's not bound by the pull of the Earth that's far below him. And then landing on the moon with its lesser mass, the pull of gravity is less. And the muscles of the astronaut, used to the stronger pull of the mass of the Earth, make him seem like a superman. And he can take great leaps into the distance with ease. But what about the mind? And what about this law of attraction that we hear so much about? A mind doesn't have any mass, doesn't occupy any space. 
So how can adjusting thoughts be the cause of attracting something? If mass attracts mass, and if the mind has no mass, then logically this law of attraction coming into play by thinking about a thing must be a bunch of hogwash. Now this brings up an interesting question, because we know that often thinking about something does cause it to happen. So now the question is, if the equation of mass attracting mass is correct, and thinking about something can attract that thing, then does the mind have mass? And that's the big question. Now, the answer is very important to you. It's important to your lifestyle, to your attitude toward things, and it's important to life in general. The answer is yes, and I can show you simply by applying logic. We know that the brain, stimulated by thoughts of the mind, creates waves of energy, brain waves, brain energy, measurable electromagnetic energy. That energy has mass. Or, or does it? Brain waves don't transmit mass. A wave transmits energy, sometimes an immense amount of energy, without transmitting mass. And as an example, the water that an ocean wave travels through. Now, the water that the wave travels through the water itself, it doesn't move forward. It only moves up and down as the wave creates a second generation of energy, the movement of the water. But the wave itself is without mass. And so we see how the wave can create a new generation of energy through its receptor. In this case, the receptor is water. In the case of the wave produced by an earthquake, the receptor would be the land. The land doesn't move, it just goes up and down. The wave of energy, however, that does move. The wave produced by the slippage of an earthquake fault creates a wave that travels through the earth for sometimes hundreds of miles. The mass is the earth itself, which moves but doesn't travel. The pull or attraction of the moon has no mass. It does, however, like the wave of the ocean, travel, sent out by the mass of the moon itself seeking a receptor. That receptor can be the ocean, the cut horn of a bull, a seed, or your mind. This energy formation can't be seen or felt, only the result of it. When you utilize this wave of energy created by the mass of the moon and control it even to a small degree, you have a better chance of seeing your goals and desires come to fruition. By utilizing this energy form coming from a particular phase of the moon, you have a new and powerful resource at your disposal. Now then, here are the dates of the new moon for the next year. The times are within the half hour. You can also download the 2011 lunar calendar from the New Moon Program members area and print it out so that you can refer to it at any time. But in the meantime, let me give you some dates. This is 2011. These are 2011 dates. January 4th, 9 a.m. February 3rd, 2 p.m. March 4th, 10 p.m., April 3rd, 2 p.m., May 3rd, 7 a.m., June 1st, 10 p.m., July 1st, 9 a.m., July 30th, 7 p.m., August 29, 3 p.m., September 27, 11 a.m., October 26, 8 p.m., November 25th, 6 a.m., December 24th, next Christmas, at 6 p.m. That will be the height of the new moon then. Should be an interesting Christmas day. 
Now, I suggest you make a note of all these dates, as you'll soon be looking forward to each one so that you can do the New Moon Programming. Part 1, Module 2. The ancient Greeks, who had a hand in the business of the moon's effect on us earth creatures, believed that all the stars and planets in the universe revolved around the earth. They were correct only with respect to the moon, which is the only celestial body to revolve around the earth, aside from our uh, satellites that we shoot up into space now. Aristotle, Plato's pupil, believed the heavens were composed of spheres to which the stars and planets were attached. And Plato called the planets great visible gods who existed in the dimension of the ether. Now, these were pretty smart guys, but not having our technological skills, they were also ignorant with regards to the basics of astronomy. Socrates, the teacher of the great Greek philosophers, and one of the wisest men throughout the ages, at least considered so, he believed that the sun and the moon were gods. And he, later on, he suffered for that belief. The skies at the time of these giants of, oh, 470 B.C. or thereabouts were viewed only by the means of the naked eye. No telescopes then. And only the most visible planets were studied and seen. And then usually during the time of the new moon, when the background wasn't diluted with the reflected light of the sun. According to the best thinking of the time, the gods of the moon, to irritate Neptune, the god of the sea, created the tides, keeping the creatures of the earth both confused and busy trying to figure out how to get their boats out of the harbors during an incoming tidal flow. These beliefs, primitive and quaint though they might have been, gave some sort of meaning to all those things of mystery that mankind were conf confronted by. They, they created metaphors to allow them to specify the abstraction. In other words, they had to see something there. And so they made things up to the best of the knowledge of the time. That didn't make them any less clever. It simply made them ignorant about the things that we know now through our technological advances. And who knows, at some time in the future, some of the things that we do now may be laughed at as ignoramuses. But for the present, we do have science. And science shows us how the mass of the moon sends out an energy flow, waves of energies that attract all things physical, gravity. This is science. We know that the moon has a definite pull on the earth and on the waters of the earth. That being so, consider what you're made up of. Consider what I'm made up of. Consider what any person is made up of. Organs and veins and bones and fats and blood and muscle, yes. But the primary ingredient to every human is water. Take out all the water in a human being and you'd fall into a pile of dust. That being the case, and with the knowledge that the moon has an effect on all the waters of the earth, it would stand to reason that the moon also has an effect on the waters of a person. I recall a morning in Athens, Greece, that is, of course. I was strolling along a street in the Plaka. That's an area of coffee shops, restaurants, tourist shops, generally small shops, just below the Acropolis. I was nibbling on a chunk of bread and a few olives, thinking that Plato may well have walked along this same street, eating the same thing, thinking great thoughts. But what I had that Plato did not have was the knowledge of modern science. Whereas to him the moon was a place where gods resided, to me it was an airless, barren place that man had already walked on and investigated. 
I knew the moon was just an empty globe stuck by gravity to a particular position in the sky. I also knew that the moon's pull on our planet did more than try to confuse mankind. I have to admit, though, that just being in Greece got me to thinking about how those ancient beliefs brought about our present ones. When I'm in another city in the United States or in in Europe, and I'm generally in a hotel, and I usually feng shui the hotel so that, well, for particular purposes, and generally the purpose I'm feng shuiing it for is for a very successful seminar. And one of the things I do is hang posters. Well, one of the posters that I hung on the wall of my hotel room in, there in Athens was that of the planet's and the moons of the planets. I remember thinking, how would the moons of Jupiter affect us if indeed they did at all? Now, Jupiter has 63 moons, all in orbit. Some of them would be considered planets if they revolved around the sun instead of a planet. Two of them, Ganymede and Callisto, each are larger than our own moon. Would they have any effect being so far from us? Ganymede has twice the mass of our moon, but the distance would prevent anything but a metaphysical attraction. I decided there in my room, as I looked at the Acropolis sitting on the highest point in the city, that I would investigate this business of the moon's pull on all things on earth just to see if that information could be useful. And so when I returned to my home in Tarzana, where I lived at the time, I got together with my good friend Ovi Sehested, who had written an encyclopedic work on the basics of astrology and did research on the moon and its effect on Earth. Gathering as much material as I could, I then decided, let me test it. So I held a seminar in New York. That seemed like the likeliest start. And so that month, uh, it was in 1984, we began. 200 people attended. And as there was a new moon that weekend, it was a perfect time for the test. Everyone received a sheet with instructions and were told to send in the results of their programming after a month had passed. I received 42 replies, all of them attesting to the fact that the new moon programming did indeed work. It worked better than programming with no outside influence. One person in particular comes to mind, a fellow named Bill Randall. He called me about three weeks after the class to tell me of a few coincidences that happened after that new moon programming seminar. He'd used the technique he'd learned not only in the class, but actually waited until the 30 minutes before the height of the moon, which happened to be at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, Bill didn't mind. He told me he wanted to get as much attraction of his message as possible. And so at 1.30, the moon would be waxing for 30 minutes more. And then after reaching its peak, it would then commence with the waning period. And it would lose power every minute instead of gaining power every minute as it did during the waxing time. Bill used the white velvet method of reaching a deep meditation. And when he was deep and concentrative, he used lunar programming as he'd learned in a supermind seminar of mine. But that I included in that seminar that he was in as it was important that everyone use the same technique so we could get the same, similar results. When deep in meditation, Bill stepped through the imaginary door, as he had learned, and he sensed with his daydreaming mechanism, creating a mental image that he was successful at what he wanted. What he wanted and what he was programming for was a house. He imagined or daydreamed himself buying the house. He imagined himself decorating the house with furniture and accessories. Mentally, he went through each room in the yard. He created a scenario that he wanted to come to be, to happen. He observed the scene that he created as though he was the director of a play with himself as the star. So far, Luna programming is similar to a dozen other programs, but here's where we depart from the norm. After visualizing all of this, Bill imagines the moon, but this time he imagines the full moon. He senses the reflected light of the sun bouncing off the moon 
energizing the scene. He bathes everything in the moonlight. And he does all this during the three-day period of the waxing of the new moon. Well, the coincidences that ultimately got him his house were almost exactly as Bill imagined it when he did the lunar programming. But Bill wasn't the only one. Not everyone programmed for a house, of course, but people started reporting having health problems resolved. One person found a job a week after the class. Another woman, after trying for a year, found herself pregnant. Five people reported money coming from strange sources. Another had a brother he hadn't spoken to for months call, and so on and on it went. Apparently, the new moon programming gave the goal setter a real kick up the scale. Well, after that, I started to teach the concept once a month for years. It works. It doesn't work every time. Nothing I know is 100%, but it works enough of the time to give hope that all things are possible. Well, let's examine why it works when it does. When you want something and you program for that thing to take place, you create an image in your mind, the thought. Always and, and every single time, nothing that you do ever takes place until you have a thought that you're going to do that thing. This is automatic. It generally happens without your knowledge of the thought. As example, a ball is laying on the floor. You bend over and pick it up. Before you picked up the ball, you had to think about picking it up. Before you thought about picking it up, you had to have a desire to pick it up. You created a thought. A fleeting thought, yes, but it was there. It had to be there as you directed yourself to pick up the ball. All physical things that you do are preceded by a thought. The thought is preceded by desire. Thoughts have energy in them. We know this because... Your thoughts can now be measured while you're thinking them. Modern technology can look into your brain and get a general idea of what you're thinking. Now, these thoughts happen in wavelengths. And like a wave, it has no mass of its own, but it affects mass by traveling through it. This thought is an energy form similar to an ocean wave that affects the water that it's traveling through. It disturbs the water, moving it up and down, and it passes through the water, but it travels, but the, it doesn't cause the water to travel. The thought, like the wave, just keeps traveling, touching every other mind on the planet, just as a wave moving through the ocean passes through all the water. If a pebble is dropped in the ocean, it causes ripples throughout the ocean, but so small that the furthest rippling can't be seen. But take something like a great mass, say a meteorite, slamming into the ocean, and the effects of that wave, this, this immense energy created by that mass, will be seen thousands of miles away. This is seen every time there's a tsunami. It's, it, it isn't uh, a, uh, a meteorite slamming into the ocean, it's an earthquake on, on the floor of the ocean, but the effect is the same. A wave is created. Now, let's take that same concept and see how the waves of the mind work. Every thought that you have leaves your mind like a wave of energy. Some thoughts are stronger than others and cause a manifestation of sorts. Your desires are the pebbles that create the thoughts. You do nothing until you desire to do the thing. The stronger the desire, the stronger the wave of energy. But you might say, but I have a strong desire to win the lottery. Why don't I win? Well, you do have a strong desire, but so do a million other people. And those people also produce waves of energy that commingle with your own. And like a hurricane of wave action with a disturbed ocean, waves of energy clash and the movement is extreme. First of all, you have to calm the receptor of the energy. With a million people programming for a winning ticket, some are calm, some are disturbed. Your chances of being the key thought are very slim. But now let's take a thing that you want that only you are programming for. Your thoughts that travel out into the, into the sphere, into the universe, 
uh, they're like a key that's looking for a, a lock to unlock. The thoughts will only manifest when it gets a fitting. Uh, let me give you an example. Here's a story for you. Let's say that you own a paper company in Philadelphia and you need more business. You program using all your resources, Luna programming and the new moon. Your message, message goes out almost, almost like the transmission of a radio station that's broadcasting a news bulletin. But the bulletin is only going to be heard by those people who are tuned into that station. The message is the key to unlock the station frequency that's tuned to the same channel. Like the radio transmission, your visualization, your daydream mechanism, so to speak, is sent out as waves of energy on a particular frequency. Just as a radio transmission hits all radios, whether they're tuned in or not, so your visualization hits every person on the planet. But so does every other mind on the planet. What makes your visualization different are three things. First of all, your intention. That is, you intend for something to take place when the visualization goes out. That gives it more energy. That, that enhances the wave. Second, the power of the new moon. The power of the new moon increases the strength of the wave you send out immensely. And the third, meditation. Programming is enhanced when the mind is passive, when the mind is relaxed, when the mind is concentrative, and that's meditation. That is the meditation state. And that is where the programming and visualizations are their strongest. Here's something like what happens during the programming. As the owner of the paper company, you program for new business during the height of the new moon. And the waves of energy your visualization has created is enhanced. It covers the globe. And somehow, coincidentally, just about that time, oh, let's say a, a peasant farmer in a small village near Beijing, China, is plowing a field. The plow hits a rock and breaks. The farmer goes to the head of his commune and the leader knows notes that it's the 10th plow to break that year. He submits an order for more plows. The maker of the plows orders steel from a company in Ohio. The head of that company has been getting a lot of orders from China lately. China demands all orders be confirmed in writing on the original paper. The steel company puts in an order for more paper. But in his haste, he forgets his normal supplier and calls your company instead. Your card has been on his desk for months without having been noticed. The order you receive is the largest in the history of your company. Now, that metaphor seems far-fetched, but programming is like flinging out a web that touches all minds, all events. That broken plow in China appears to be a long stretch from a paper company in Philadelphia, but it's all connected. And that's pretty much the way the coincidence and programming work. In the next module, you'll find our first Luna Meditation. It's a bit different than most, but it's just a toe dip as you learn this different programming method of utilizing the power of the moon. Part 1, Module 3, Luna Meditation. At this time, relax. We'll start with a 3 to 1 count. And this module, of course, is not to be played in a moving vehicle. This is a meditation exercise. Find a comfortable position. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And as you exhale, mentally repeat and visualize the number three, three times. Take another deep breath, and as you exhale, mentally repeat and visualize the number two three times. Take another deep breath, and as you exhale, mentally repeat and visualize the number one three times.
to help you to enter a deeper, a more relaxed level of mind, I'm going to count from 10 to 1. On each descending number, feel yourself going inward, and you will enter a pleasant, a relaxed level of mind where you'll be able to concentrate fully on one subject. 10. 9. Feel going deeper. 8. 7. 6. Feel going deeper and deeper. 5. 4. 3. Deeper and deeper. 2. 1. You are now at a pleasant, a relaxed level of mind where, where you're able to concentrate fully on one subject. At this time, concentrate on my words. You are now and always in complete control of your state of mind. You can open your eyes. You can be fully alert any time you wish to be. Every time you enter this relaxed meditation state, know that you're getting better and better in every way. Whenever you enter this relaxed meditation state, you will mentally say, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. When you say these words, sense yourself improving in all areas of your life. Sense yourself getting better and better. Visualize improvements in your life now as you mentally repeat the words. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Relax. Relax now and direct your attention to your eyes. Relax your eyes. Now direct your attention to your lips and your jaw. Relax your lips and jaw. Relax your entire head. And relax your neck. That's fine. Now relax your shoulders. Relax your arms and your hands. Relax the upper part of your body, your chest, your back. And now your stomach and the small of your back. Relax your thighs. Relax your legs and your feet. You're now completely relaxed. Repeat mentally, my body rests and refreshes itself when I consciously relax. I am relaxed now. Repeat mentally after me. Every day, my image of myself gets better. I can do anything I have a desire to do. I am a wonderful, unique human being. There's no one else on earth exactly like me. Every day I grow stronger, knowing that I can. I can think. I can create. I can do. I can do anything I have a desire to do. Relax. Imagine now that you're sitting 
and that there is a white velvet curtain in front of you. Next to you is a box filled with black numbers. The numbers are from 1 to 10. In a moment, you'll reach into the box and remove a number. The number that you reach will be in sequence. You don't have to be concerned. At first, when you reach into the box, your hand will pull out the number 10. And then you will take the number 10 and lay it on the white velvet curtain. The number will stick. And then you'll reach into the box and take out the number 9 and put it on the curtain. And that number will stick to the curtain. And then the number 8 and so on until you've taken each of the 10 numbers out of the box and place them on the velvet curtain in front of you. The numbers are made so that they will stick on the velvet curtain. Now then, take the black numbers out of the box one at a time and hang them all on the white velvet curtain, starting with the number 10 and continue until you reach the number 1. Begin. If you've not yet reached the number one, imagine that all the ten numbers are on the velvet curtain. Relax. And now, remove the numbers one at a time, starting with the number ten. Reach up to the number ten, Take it off the curtain and put it back in the box. Now the number nine. Now the number eight. Now the number seven. Put it back in the box. Now the number six. Now the number five. Now the number four. Now the number three. Now the number two. And there's one number left on the curtain. Now reach up and take the number one and put that in the box. And now allow the velvet curtain and the box to disappear from the scene. Very good. You are now at a deeper, more concentrative level of mind. And now then, as I use the mantra OM, you mentally will follow along with me. Each OM will take you deeper into the meditation and you'll be more concentrative so that the programming that you will be doing is more likely to be successful. Relax. Just follow along with me mentally. OM Imagine now the moon. Visualize the great moon that is between the earth and the sun. Imagine the pull of the moon. Imagine the tides of the ocean 
driving the water higher as the new moon's gravitational pull attracts. This pull will enhance all of your programming, especially that program that we will now be doing. Think about the program. Think about what you want to come to be, what it is that you'd like to attract or perhaps repel. Think about that now and relax. Just relax. And for this, the first of the New Moon Meditations will use a standard programming device to enable you to saturate the universe with your thoughts. You needn't consider the moon at this time because you are in meditation close to the height of the new moon and your program's energy will float from your mind and saturate the universe automatically. Relax. And imagine that you're standing in a hallway. A small hallway with a door at the opposite end of where you're standing. Create the door. Make it, make it ornate. On the other side of that door is your heart's desire, the thing that you're programming for. What is it that you desire? What is it that you'd like to manifest? Think about that thing that you want to achieve, to attract, to get, to have. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to three, and you'll walk through the door, and you'll see a scene. Some action will be taking place. You will be part of the action. You will observe the scene as though it were a play. You're the director of that event, as well as the observer. You can watch it as it unfolds. What you create on the other side of that door is what you are programming for. You will see the goal is already accomplished and you happy with the result. I will now count. One, two, three. The door is opening and the door is open. Imagine it. Now walk through the door and imagine the end result of your goal accomplished. Take your time. I'll, I will allow you plenty of time. Relax and begin. Visualize your goal accomplished. Relax. Now imagine the moon, but this time it will be the full moon. Imagine the reflected light of the full moon brightening the entire scene. Imagine the entire scene is bathed in the light of the moon. Allow the light of the full moon to permeate the entire scene. And now back into the hallway and allow the door to close. The door is closed. Imagine that. Whenever you think of the thing that you're programming for, think of the event as already accomplished. Every morning when you think of your goal, repeat the phrase, every day, in every way, I am getting better and better. You may program for your goal at any time, but do be sure to program during every new moon. Relax. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five. At that moment, you'll open your eyes, you'll be wide awake, feeling wonderfully refreshed, feeling better than before. One, two, three, coming out slowly, four and five. 
eyes open, wide awake, feeling relaxed and comfortable, feeling better than before. Part 2, Module 4. There are many different ways and many different things that people program for. Most of them are done subconsciously. But the number one thing that people in general seem to want above all others is abundance. Well, now that's one of the main things people in general would like. More of things. Abundance. This is the one objective that everyone seems to be interested in. Having more. More. More friends. Better health more acknowledgement, and most of all, more money. Abundance is so often intermingled with affluence that people forget they're not quite the same. Affluence is wealth, prosperity, riches. Abundance is simply more, more of something. So let's see about programming, the programming of more, abundance. What is it you want more of? Let's say that it's money. And, of course, the things that money can buy. Aside from health and relationships, where you might think that money can't help, well, money does help to some degree with health and with relationships as well. Better care is an example. But wealth is what people seem to want, or at least enough money so that it no longer is a concern. So then, as this program is about using the new moon to attract, how about attracting affluence? Well, let's see how this new resource of programming with the strength of the new moon behind you, how that can pay off. Before we can use it, however, you want to clarify. You must clarify your intent. What's the purpose of your programming? What do you want out of it? Let's use the general factor and say that your intention is to send a message to the universe that you want money. Okay, that's the first step. You want to get the message out so that you'll attract that affluence through a series of coincidences. There's a story that I tell during my seminars of a good man who constantly prays for some money to leave his children as he's been told he has only two weeks to live. His time is short, and the only way left for him is to win the lottery. He prays to win the lottery. He says in his prayer that he's always been a good person, which he has, charitable, with never a harsh word for anyone, and that if anybody deserved good fortune, it was him. Why couldn't he be allowed to win the lottery so that his children would have more than he did? Why couldn't he do that before he left the world? Again and again he prays until there's only a few days left for him on the earth. And then, just before his demise, he hears a booming voice saying, Carl, do me a favor. Buy a ticket. Now, there's much to that somewhat amusing tale. You must have a ticket if there's any chance of all of winning. But what's your ticket to affluence? What you want is the universe to notice you. And one manner in which to do that is to broadcast your needs and wants through the faculty of meditation, and then to enhance the outgoing forces with the power of the moon. There are two basic ways in which to send your message out. The message saying that you want something, and can the universe help you to get that thing. Let me compare the thoughts that you send out with a radio transmission. A station that sends out a song played, oh, let's say a musical group called the Songsters. The Songsters sing into a microphone, and that vibration is sent out via radio waves. But the station that's broadcasting the song is only operating at 5,000 watts as the station is a small station in a small town. The radio waves go out, but as it's only 5,000 watts, it gets very weak with distance and doesn't get into the large city that's not too far away. If you were in the city and tuned into that station, you might hear a static-filled song, but barely. 
and chances are you'll tune into a different station. The radio waves, they go out, they permeate the entire globe, but they're so weak, the only people that can hear the station clearly are those in the small town where it's being broadcast. In the nearby city, the radio station broadcasts at 50,000 watts. That broadcast sends out radio waves in a much wider net. It can be heard hundreds of miles away, and under the right conditions, people tuned into that station thousands of miles away can hear it, and they hear it in the clear. The more wattage, the further the reach, the clearer the sound. In a similar manner, the mind's transmissions, as indicated by brain waves, send out messages as you think. Every thought is a transmission, but most of them transmitted as weak emanations, they don't go anywhere. But every now and again, your thoughts are intensified. How? By your emotions. As example, when you're angry, when you're fearful, when you feel guilty about something, when you're resentful, or as with positive thoughts, when you're loving, when you're kindly, when you're thoughtful. The strength of the thought carries the waves of energy created by the, the strength, the enhanced degree of the thought. They carry the thought further out into the universe. This is one of the reasons that people who are angry all the time live in a different world than the person who might be right next to them, a family member, as example, who has loving thoughts. The thought attracts a similar, alike response. Change the thought, then you change the reality. The thought naturally attracts. All this is done on the outer conscious level. You have thousands of thoughts every day, but most of them, they just dissipate and they don't attract the response. But when a coincidence or accident or even a deja vu occurrence takes place, you can bet that it was preceded by one of your thoughts. Your thoughts, every single one of them, go out into the universe. Some of them attract the response. And some just keep on traveling, like a pebble dropped into a lake cause a series of ripples. When you consciously create a thought with intent behind it, the thought strengthens and seeks manifestation. The thought touches everyone, but so do all other thoughts. So why should your thought have any more effect than any other thought? Well, first of all, there's the vehicle the thought is carried on. Our vehicle will be Luna programming, the goal-setting device. Luna programming will be carried out during a meditation. When you think thoughts at the outer conscious level, those thoughts are like the 5,000-watt station. But during meditation, when you're highly concentrative, the minutiae of thoughts that flit through your mind, they're, they're gone. And that concentrative state that we call meditation enhances your thoughts strengthens them, and suddenly you're turned into a 50,000-watt station, and the thought is more likely to manifest as now it touches every person. But this time, the intent is carried along with the thought as well. Remember the story of the paper company business, business person programming for more business, whose thoughts ultimately reached a farmer plowing his field in China? Let's extend the metaphor. By taking an ordinary thought, and you have tons of them every day, and say that those ordinary thoughts are like the 5,000-watt station. They leave your mind, obviously, because you have thought them. But there are no emotions involved, nor were you concentrated when you thought them. So we'll call those thoughts the 5,000-watt variety. Now, think those thoughts when you're highly emotional, like when you're furious, scared, resentful, in a panic, or any other emotional thought, including positive thoughts, then your brain waves are enhanced and uh, say like the five, like the not the five, but the 50,000 watt station. But they're not in control. They're out of control. And they may attract things that you, you really don't want. But what if that 50,000 watt thought could be controlled? What if you could turn it into a 500,000 watt thought? Wow, you might just surprise yourself with your goal-setting process. Well, let's see how you can do that. 
Still using the same metaphor, let's say that the 5,000 watt thought, the thought that you want to use to attract something to you, is something that you desire, but you don't have a vehicle to get that thought working for you. Desire can be strengthened by utilizing your daydream mechanism and creating mental images of the thing that you want. That would be the first step. Now then, what do you intend to do with the subject of the thought? Is it money that you intend to attract? What's the money for? What do you intend to do with the money? Intent and desire intensify the thought. Add the attraction and pull of the new moon, and that 50,000 watt thought is really intensified. Now you may very well be sending out a 500,000 watt thought a thought that will reach everyone who could possibly be influenced by the thought, clear and static-free. Now that's power, and it's under your control, and your programs are more likely to come to be. Everyone programs, even people who've never heard of the word. Everyone has a goal. For some, in poverty-stricken societies, the goal is to drink clean water or or find a few grains of rice. For the affluent, the goal is a, a larger house, a luxury car, luxurious foods, expensive clothes. And for those in between, they yearn for better things than they already have. Behind all those conscious and subconscious programs are two emotions that either help or get in the way. And those are motivation and resolve. And the way that I'm defining the word resolve is that of making a decision. Another word for this is intent. What is your intention? But let's use resolve in the manner of making a decision. This is most important. Okay, you've decided to use the new moon process for your goal. Fine, don't question it, just do it. But to do it, you have to have a vehicle. You may want to go from New York to Los Angeles, but there are many means for you to use to get there. You can walk, you can run, you can drive a car, take a bus, take a train, or fly. You could even go around and through the Panama Canal by boat. All those means will get you from the East Coast to the West Coast, but in all probability, you'll fly, because that's the safest and the quickest way to accomplish your goal. Your goal is to get to Los Angeles. Your intent is that you resolve to fly. And so a jet plane is your means. Now then, your goal is to attract money, affluence. And as you want more, abundance as well. You can use any one of a dozen devices. There's goal setting through meditation. There's qigong. There's feng shui. There's prayer, labyrinths, candles, icons, and all kinds of material. But they're only the means. In addition to all those devices, there is intent. Without intent, it would just be a a kind of foolish preoccupation, a hobby. Just by utilizing a device indicates intent. And so the device that we'll be using is the Luna Meditation, once again. And so to sum up, When you want to use the law of attraction to bring affluence and abundance to you, the best way to do that is to activate the law. The way to activate the law of attraction is to send out a message that you want something. The most effective way of sending that message out is through meditation. While at the meditation state of mind, with body and mind relaxed and concentrative, you utilize a device to get the message out. The device is a goal-setting channel, Luna Meditation. When you are meditating and concentrative, you're like the difference between the 5,000 and the 50,000-watt radio station. You're broadcasting at 50,000 watts, metaphorically speaking, when you do it at the meditation level of mind.